I'm now going to use my stock joke of I am all that stands between you and refreshments. Um, and in terms of refreshments, unlike lunchtime, they should be quite fulfilling um, with, uh, I think, beer, I'm told, wine, I'm told, various other forms of alcohol. And I think for those of you who really want to wimp out, there's also some orange juice and apple juice. So um, we're going to rattle through this session and condense it ever so slightly. But because this is your opportunity to ask questions of the panel, um, specifically, please, focused around how you can tell whether the organisation is ready and what lessons these guys can offer you about barriers and enablers that they've experienced and how they've overcome them or how they've sweated them. If we can keep it focused around those, that would be great. If there's more time a little bit later on, we'll open up for more questions. Uh, and I'm going to kick off with the first question. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you for questions and please, preferably to start with, guys at the back of the room, if you can put your hands up because my two mic runners will then have to run all the way up the stairs at full speed. And I just want to see that because I've never seen them run before. <laughs> so, thank you very much for our panel. Thank you very much for your presentations today. Um, phenomenal, excellent presentations. Certainly give a, a robust starting point in terms of the type of things that are going on at the moment and what that means to, to you, your, your organisations yourself but potentially even your client organisations. One of the things I, I often get hung up on in, in the whole blockchain space is this issue of how you convince a non-techie that there's something to be done here and that this is a solution that's worth exploiting. Clearly, a techie can get quite enthusiastic about this, a little bit evangelical about it. Certain business people might also follow along with that. But then as we maybe move up the organization and into different stakeholder communities, that could become more difficult. So I'd be keen to get your views there. Maybe, maybe we can get yours first, Ross, in terms of how you would deal with that within a client organisation. Well, well, I mean, we've, we, well, we've kind of tried to deal with it. It's, 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 despite the enthusiasm and excitement around blockchain, it, and, and actually it's bewildering that we're, what, eight years into this and, and, and there's so many, well, there's so many people here today for a start. I, you think back to, if we were eight years into mobile, most of us were still probably umbilically linked to our kitchen walls. Mm -hmm. So this is moving really quick. And I think it's, I think Bitcoin's got a lot to do with that. I think that scared a lot of people. Like what, you mean you can transfer money without using the existing systems and we don't get our cut. So there's, the, the, the challenge of selling blockchain is actually quite difficult because mm -hmm. as, as, as Tom said, you know, you, unless everyone's using it, you're not getting a massive benefit and you might as well use a database. Um, the way we've approached it is we've kind of broken it down, and as I mentioned, into sort of what we call sort of POCs, proof of concepts, which we, we'll, we'll run it in sort of short sprints, six, eight weeks, not a massive investment of time or money. So it, 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 that's proved very useful for actually allowing our clients to test out technology we've developed without really taking too much of a risk. Right. And as we're finding now that we're, I mean, we've only been running this program for maybe sort of three months. But now that we're into it, we are actually finding that people are saying, actually, this looks like it can work. Can you scope up the next level? Which was obviously fundamentally the point in the first place. But, you know, that's, that's so, making so, it small and, and, and less scary. Okay, so something in there about bite-size activities and trying to get it into... I quite like the concept of the agile approach and the short sprints. But again, even that to maybe uh, an organisation that perceives they've spent a lot on technology. Perhaps, Maria, you can tell us a little bit about RBS because clearly... Typically, with most banks, spend a lot of money on technology. True. I think uh, RBS as a bank, we want to come across as an organization which is focused very much on technology because we as an organization, all our senior leaders agree and, um, on, on the fact that if it is not going to be technology, just like we had industrial revolution a few years back, now is the age of digital revolution. And with all the new challenger banks coming up and the way, the speed at which uh, this industry is being targeted and uh, disrupted, it's important to realize that if you don't change fast enough, there will be some other company or technology that will disrupt you. So you need to change. And I think um, RBS, uh, we were just happy that our senior leaders understand that uh, very well. And we're able to communicate the technology and the process in which we can implement it very quickly within a particular area, for example, payments. Uh, when we have a very clear idea of where exactly a particular technology would fit, how exactly it would deliver solutions in a quick and effective way, and how would that help us serve our customers better. I think that is the approach that you need to take. And just like Ross mentioned, we have uh, Innovation Spikes, which we run for about four days. Right. We get a bunch of engineers and business guys together, and then we take it to the main stakeholders and see where it goes from there. Yeah, 
Okay. I quite like, again, from that, then the, the takeaway for me is that this notion of um, it, it becomes a little bit more leverage, you know, the do or die. If we don't do it, someone else is going to do it, and that might actually take business away from us. Um, clearly, that can be useful. At the same time, it could be double-edged in the sense that some people might just give up. I don't know. Do you have views on that? Well, certainly in terms of a <coughs> looking at one particular area where we were dealing with an answer initially from current members. Uh, we have five members compet competing organisations who have worked together to look at a solution that brings together the, the mutualisation of the logic and, uh, and allows them to share customers. Mm. And there was a sixth organisation that we were talking to, and it's not a sell, it's like, look, this should be a good thing for you to get involved in, here's the risk if you don't. And when you actually draw the box and say, there's the five that are in, yeah. and you draw the box of the one that's out, all of a sudden that fear factor, that, that really hits home, like, well, hold on, they're all going to be sharing customers. Okay, we might lose some, but you're not going to get any over there if you don't join. So that, that comes through with a communication with potential members. But moving away from R3, I think the broader marketplace is going to mature at pace to the point where this is less of an issue. It will just become more mainstream. Yeah. We, won't, we don't have web... <laughs> Uh, like seminars or, or, or talks, we talk about sure. things that are done on it. And like the last point on that is if you're not in R3 or any other consortium, that I still think that getting out there and collaborating through Deloitte or whatever it is mm. with your peers is a fundamental way of getting on that journey. Yeah, okay, time to be brave, talk to other people, potentially talk to the competition. It is a danger if you, you know, there's a danger with this as well. If you send one person from your organisation and they get skilled up, then guess what? They might not be working. <laughs> Your yep. organisation very soon. So you need to make sure that that, that, that knowledge share is happening through your organisation's light touch. In, very interesting theme. Difficulty of resources and keeping them, particularly in a market which is evolving quite rapidly. OK, maybe we can get one or two questions now from the audience. Anybody have a question for the panel? I've got one right down at the front, but that's not going to get the mic up the back. <laughs> Over here in the pink shirt. I'll come, I'll come back to you, Christopher, if that's all right. I suppose it's talking about income streams for, um, you talk about Deloitte, you give open source, then how do you make your money? But it was more around regulators, because at the end of the day, they're the type of people that you, you need to have to, to go ahead with. You know, the example you gave earlier on, um, in the European Central Bank, where they pay, we pay them for every trade we do, whatever. They're going to lose an income stream. What happens there? Why would they, they ultimately want to, to make money, keep a stream coming in, but why would they say yes to, a, some, to something else that makes them no income? <coughs> is that direct to directly? Answer? Everyone. <laughs> I don't know, it's a hard one to answer, but I don't know. Well, I was, that's a I, challenge. I would start by saying life's not fair, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and you don't always get what you want. So um, the trouble is, banks really are there primarily to serve customers, and if the customers want to use a certain type of technology, then they'll use it, and, it, and you don't have to stay with the bank you're with. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer in terms of what they're going to do about it. But the fact is, they're going to have to do something about it. Or, or you know, I, mean, I don't know if you've, you've looked at the concept of FedCoin, um, <coughs> the, the concept that you, you know, you'd get rid of fiat currency, you just switch to, switch to mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, which you, uh, central bank, uh, um, the Chinese Bank of China are looking to do it, mm -hmm. largely because of the fiat leaks that they're having with people dumping money into to Bitcoin and other cryptos. Um, I mean, I like that model. I, I, I'm a big fan of a, a sort of, a, you know, a, a, a crypto world, um, it, it causes problems though, because if you look at central banks, in, in, in my view, one of the reasons we've got so many um, retail banks and customer facing banks is because it would be a nightmare for a central bank to administer money to millions and millions of people. So Barclays or RBS will do it on our behalf. But if you in, uh, then issued a central Fed coin or, or crypto coin, then the, the, there would be no need for your retail banks to offer that service. They'd then have to offer another service. Possibly they'd offer an identity attestation service. I don't know. But there's other ways that you can make money. And there's always better ways to make money than, than selling products that the customer doesn't necessarily need. You're always going to retain your customers better if you give them what you want. And, well, as I go back to the original point, life's not fair. Stuff keeps moving on. I know they want to make money, but they're going to have to do something about it to remain relevant. I think there's a, another side to this as well. So, so to Brian's point and, and Ross's, as we talked about trying to get people into this, this new world, 
this is a new world that isn't entirely ready to be gotten into yet in, in many ways. So I look at enterprise readiness as the enterprise readiness of the platform itself. And as one of the grayer beards up on this panel, uh, you know, my, my experience tells me when I see something that is, is not quite ready for prime time, you know, I don't rush into that. I, and, and the last thing I'm going to do is tell my clients, you know, give them the fear of missing out factor there. I, I want to tell them that this is going to take a while to evolve, to settle out, to, to strengthen and to, to harden so that it will be capable of sustaining production capabilities. So, you know, we, we, we see a lot of startups out there that, are, that are, have, have terrific ideas, but one of the things we see is that they're lacking a certain amount of fundamentals, what I would call blocking and tackling. Um, fundamentals of data management, fundamentals of data architecture, things like that that should be behind any business solution. But a lot of these companies are rushing to market to try to, try to beat the other companies that are out there. And, and there's a tremendous gold rush going on here. And I think we have to be, we, we have to take a step back from that and, and look for partners who are thoughtful, uh, who have good, uh, good design capabilities, good architecture capabilities, who understand the markets they're getting into. There's a lot of solutions being proffered out here that uh, really, w when you take a look at them, don't make sense. Uh, the, the earlier uh, statement about, you know, if, if, if a database can do it, don't do it. I mean, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. So, so, you know, I think we have to be cautious about what we leap into. I don't think we have to leap into anything with the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good advice. Philly? Yeah, and at the same time, I think we also need, uh, in, in particular, big organizations uh, need quite a while to understand what, how this is going to transform mm -hmm. their uh, businesses. So at the same time, you need to rush to understand, to, to test things, to develop uh, prototypes, uh, maybe not final products, but at least to understand what the technology is enabling and, um, and how you can use it and how you should change and transform your organization uh, uh, accordingly. Mm. I and think this, I mean, this, this, this for me plays to the point that Ross is making about, uh, I mean, it's almost a very generous thing to do to, to build the lab develop some concepts and then put them into the public domain to allow people to start exploring things. But that's probably what's going to kickstart that process, yeah. at least make it a little bit safer for organizations to, I'm not going to use the term dabble, but to explore. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. OK, any other questions? Oh, sorry, Christopher, we have one down here, sorry. So one thing that's been um, sort of absent from the discussion so far that's kind of like a low-hanging fruit for enterprise that I is uh, things like proof of existence to help with rec records, with uh, custodianship, proof, you know, uh, chain of custody, and just in general the whole problem of, um, you know, provenance. Uh, those can be done very inexpensively with existing blockchains. You don't need to have a separate blockchain for it. Um, what are the opportunities there for enterprise for com doing compliance? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a start there. So the use case of, of provenance of, of uh, the, the, the asset registry, I think, is one of the most applicable for blockchain right off the bat, as you said. And I think, you know, for example, we can tokenize any asset and track it on the blockchain and know, you know, know where it's been, know where it's gone. Uh, know where it is at any point. And, and uh, certainly at, at Spiritus, that's one of the things we're exploring in the healthcare space is provenance of medical devices. I think it's very uniquely suited to that in that it, it's a registry, you know, it's, it's a ledger. I mean, the, the problems we're seeing with some of the use cases is trying to put everything in the blockchain. And, and that's just a bad way to go from the start. It's not going to scale. But you can do a very lightweight registry to track things, to track provenance of, of assets or, or, or other you know, other, other things uh, very easily. And, and I think the, the immutability of it is what makes it attractive to people, helps us to fight fraud, helps us to understand, uh, you know, where, where everything we sell is at any time, uh, which in certain industries is extremely useful. And in the medical device industry, you know, if something goes wrong with a device, if somebody implants a stent and, and it unravels inside somebody's body, I want to know very quickly where the rest of my stents are so that I can prevent that happening again. So that, that, I, I agree completely, Christopher. I, I think that's, that's a, a very well-suited use case for this technology. OK. 
Okay. Any other comments? No? Yeah, we, we'll get okay, hopefully that answers the question, Christopher. projects, and some of them are exactly in there. We were just demoing yesterday uh, for the first time what we've been doing around insurance and reinsurance space and how it's not just, I agree completely with what you're saying, but it's quite quickly where you can take these, uh, these, these solutions where you see that that's now more, that's new information that we've never had pulled together. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you can start to do analytics that you've never been able to do. And therefore, the regulator can have a, a better view of things, but also you, you, you start building off of that. So that's the, the, the insurance space, but back in uh, the sort of traditional banking, it's a, a hot spot as well. Can, can I just ask a question? You, you mentioned the regulator, and I'm, I'm always interested in this space because I'm always concerned about interference, for want of a better term. But what do you think, uh, or to what extent do you think the lag with the regulator gaining an understanding or an appreciation for blockchain is going to actually slow down the pace at which that regulator can get involved? So it depends on where we're talking about. Uh, this, the regulators are a little bit like any other uh, group of market participants. There's, there's different parts of the maturity curve. Some of them are way, way in front of the majority yeah. of the other firms that we uh, interact with. Uh, in the FCA, for example, they're extremely on the front foot with this. I met with them on Monday, and it was, you're looking at, you may well have projects that we've got, but the regulators, we forget, have got the same challenges that mm -hmm. the, the firms that they're regulating are, have got as well. So they're looking to see how they can apply it internally to, to, to assist with their needs. But they're very keen on collapsing this in an arguably antiquated process that we've got at times where you say, we're regulating the data as it flows in real time. We'll give you a node to look at it, but also we can put the regulatory yeah. rules in the smart contract. Therefore, all that reporting, to a degree, is no longer required. We're not going to go and start with method two. Mm -hmm. We might start uh, chipping away at it, but yeah. we're looking at simpler things where there's been no automation, coming back to the point made earlier. So regulators in Australasia, in Asia, uh, in, uh, in some of the other areas, are completely on the front foot, and they're also talking to one another as well. Right. R three, we are uh, opening up our membership to the regulators as well. So we've we've got the uh, the first wave that we're dealing with, but it's beyond us again. This is happening. They're looking at how they can work together. Is there a regulator who, or a space, a sector that you think concerns you in terms of either a lack of interest or apathy geographically with, with the regulators? Uh, no, nothing's jumped now. The, 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 the fool of the world is, is, is looking at this as, uh, at the same pace, give or take. I had, a, I had a, an interesting conversation recently, uh, just a bit of personal disclosure. We've got an initiative running at the moment within the drone space, and it's, uh, it's, it's regulated airspace below 500 metres mm -hmm. to automate drone uh, collision procedures, which relies on the blockchain. Mm. It's built on the blockchain. But we are struggling in certain current countries to get the, the regulators sufficiently fired up and interested in what can be done and to get excited about the prospects of then extending initiatives such as this into general aviation and potentially then into commercial aviation. If you've got any tips there, that, they would be very welcome. Well, I think times, uh, times is, time is an important factor. If you, over the last, I think, over this year, uh, the, the, the perspective has completely changed from a regulator point of view. They were very reluctant last year, and they have started to understand the benefits mm -hmm. this year. Uh, we find it's quite, it's quite interesting that we can get people like politicians, elected politicians, we can get them fired up because we can talk about the sure. political rhetoric. Um, getting a, sometimes getting the... The, the people who have got too much of a day job or business as usual to mm -hmm. get on with within the civil service might struggle to give you the, the, the time to then discuss this. And then there's that middle ground somewhere in there for whom it is their responsibility to look at these things. But because they've got a list of other projects that may be regarded as more attractive or already funded, it becomes difficult to shoehorn other new things in. So again, as a barrier, it, it presents a very real barrier to making progress there. But at the same time, it doesn't stop us. But I can see many organizations backing away from ventures in that space if they reach a roadblock like that. Well, I don't know if you agree, but I would say it's also depending on the benefit they see. And in the financial market, I think they, they, they had so many issues in getting the data out of the banks that having an, a, a direct access yeah. To, the, to the real data 
is, is really a new thing for I them. Get, I get that within the financial services space. I think that's quite an interesting example. Just to add on to that one, I think that's a very fair point. I mean, we, we've seen how over the past few years, regulators have had this problem where uh, RBS and Barclays, we have our own ledgers, and at mm. the end of the day, where all the trades have been settled and cleared, we all go back to the Bank of England with yeah. different, uh, different records. And Bank of England essentially stands there like a man with two clocks, not knowing the right time. And then we have spent man hours and years of work and effort into maintaining these ledgers where people are just at the back end, are talking to each other, reconciling these differences. So I think blockchain in the financial sector, especially with reconciliation, accounting and reporting, mm. adds a lot of benefit to the regulator. So I see yeah. where exactly they see the benefit and then they become active in participating into this discussion. And, and, and I think there's an opportunity for for us to lead regulatory reform. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, we've talked about the antiquated systems that are in place now, I, I, I think ultimately the goal of regulators is to improve the function of a system. Um, if, you know, if this natively can, can simplify and, and actually uh, remove fraud and, and things like that, and money laundering, things like that, it, it's in their interest. Yeah. So I, you know, I think we can lead the, re, you know, the regulatory reform in that space, healthcare just as well, because they, you know, ultimately their goal is to improve the outcomes for the patient. Yeah. Uh, if, if we can improve that with this technology, I think, I think it's, it's something they'll want to get on board with. Now, obviously, you, you made a great point, Paul. There's, there's a little bit of a, you know, that's not the way it's done. Yeah. Right? But, you know, that, you, that, that's, that's going to happen no matter what. I, I, I mean, I think, personally, I think these things can be overcome. I think it's just a matter of trying to find that. It's the win-win, the classic win-win. Yeah. If you can present the benefit of the outcome to the regulator, yep. I, I, I get that entirely. One, my, one my, my, that sorry, can I just say, my, my, my challenge with this is, the work that goes into that compared to the actual project work you have to implement anyway mm -hmm. starts to create this increasing mass of activity that may mean that you're spending a lot of time building out your proof of concept where it can never exist mm -hmm. as a live system because you're never going to get that regulatory approval. Yeah, yeah but this is what banks have been doing increasingly yeah. over the years. I mean, look at uh, the, the increase of regulatory budget. Uh, yeah. It has been tremendous. So. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Brian. I'm so just going to make the point there as well. The regulators that we're dealing with have got incredibly strong technology teams. I think it's, it's an evolution there as well in the last X years where they've had to deal with all that data coming in, the yeah. built teams. So some of them are very much in the front foot of how this technology is key for the industry as well. And we're certainly seeing that the buy-in is is at the, the, the upper echelons of, um, of a, a large percentage of the regulators. And the same's happening elsewhere. It's now mm -hmm. happening even in the asset management space where it's, it's slowly becoming more apparent. Not as apparent where the immediate gains yeah. are, but we're, 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 we're getting there. Good stuff. Questions? Right at the back there. Daryl, run. I suppose it's more of a, a comment that <coughs> it would be interesting to get the panel's feedback on than a question as such. But so over the years, we've seen you know, technology evolve. And you know, if you look at the applications that exist on the internet today, uh, you know, it was sort of born out of the US military and then academic, ac academia and then university dropouts. And we've always had this sort of improvement you know so now anyone can go and build a scalable an application that scales to billions of people mm -hmm. in a matter of a few months mm -hmm. it's available to everyone and i suppose where my comment comes in is very positive to see you know people like um deloitte's and um, rbs open sourcing their activities and i think the fact that there are these patterns that people can use to initiate their product projects will eliminate a huge barrier to entry and you know stimulate the adoption of other places. So, you know, I encourage as many of the banks and, and other participants to do the same. Agreed. No? Agreed. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you for that. Any any questions? Apologies so if I can't I've see heard you. That, that technology is, it's really great technology and it's going to revolutionize the financial industry and et cetera. But I mean, what, what do you guys think are potential drawbacks and the biggest challenges uh, while developing this technology, implementing it? 
Well, I mean, I would, I would start by saying what we're building just now is not going to be the thing that we use. I mean, we're, right. we're probably, I've kind of joked that this is like, we're building like WAP. It kind of had to happen so we can get the fully immersive mobile experience we now have, but it's not going to be the thing that we fundamentally use. So, um, but that's why we do technology, isn't it? We're always just trying to push new things and try out, uh, you know, new, new experiments. And, and actually, and that, that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing experiments. I mean, the, the Emerald use case, it's worth having a read. It's not a big read, mm. but it's very sort of scientific. Like, this is what we set out to achieve. These are the results. This is what we're going to do next as a, as a part of that, you know. So I think as long as everyone has that mentality and continually works to try and improve, yeah, we'll have barriers, but they're not going to be insurmountable. And, and, and I think there's, there's been a great deal of evolution already. So, you know, from, from the, the humble beginnings of Bitcoin, you know, we moved into the, you know, the, the, the pure blockchain ledger, non-Bitcoin blockchain ledger. We've moved into uh, private ledgers. There, there's been a tremendous amount of evolution already. I don't think it's anywhere near done. Mm -hmm. I think the use cases we're seeing are stimulating a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and I too wish George Salmon had been able to be here today to, to talk about consensus mechanisms. Consensus mechanisms started out as proof of work, period. Um, and the evolution in this year alone has been <coughs> astonishing. Uh, and, and to the point where now, you know, we're, we're considering a use case where we're gonna need hybrid consensus mechanisms, depending who are the parties involved at which stage of the life cycle of a product uh, who want, you know, want either more or less uh, transparency in the transaction. So, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing incredible change in that. Uh, and, and I think it's going to continue to evolve to support the use cases that are put forward. So, uh, I, you know, the one thing is we need to keep pushing these use cases forward and trying them out. Keep experimenting. That's what's that's what's causing all of this evolution in this. Anyone else? Well, I, I think one one comment is uh, the disruption for for the people. I think that there's a number of jobs which are going to be cut. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry for that, but uh, yeah. I think it has to be remi reminded. And uh, um, so things are going to get more and more automated, and blockchain will be instrumental for this. Um, and another comment is also. Uh, something Christopher touched earlier, um, we need to have sustainable technologies because we are talking, in, in particular for financial product as I presented today, we, we sometimes have products that are lasting 30 years. Yeah. So it, it's quite long. So we, we, it's a bit of a drawback also because if, if we implement the life cycle of products within, this, within a, a blockchain technology, we have to ensure that it will be there for 30 years. So we will have a lot of migrations also to perform, probably. Yeah. Good. OK, I think maybe perhaps uh, one more if there are... Hi, just interested in the panel's view on stewardship, um, particularly uh, in addressing some of the perils that Christopher talked about earlier today. Mm. Who wants to go first? Bob? I'll, I'll, I'll take one stab at that um, as, as a, a lifetime data analytics consultant, you know, I've, I've had to deal with the data stewardship my whole career and, and very important. I, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. I think the fundamental blocking and tackling of any solution uh, needs to be applied to everything we do with this technology. We can't, you know, it isn't just a matter of throwing blockchain at it or throwing it at the blockchain. Uh, all of the things that we've had to do to be, to be careful and, and effective uh, engineers of software and, and solution designers and builders have to be put in place for this as well. So you know, just the, the, the one, uh, the, 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 the moment that, that made that as clear as it could be was the DAO. Mm -hmm. When uh, a solution was put out there, it got out ahead of itself, got over its skis, a great deal of money was lost, fundamentally because someone, someone who didn't understand the language they were coding in didn't test a solution enough, right. and, and some fundamental errors were made in, in the way you build code. Um, and that probably could have been avoided, but again, that was the rush to market, uh, and, and you know, unfortunately, that wasn't so much a POC because you know, there was a lot of money to be lost. Um, so, you know, there, you, you need to be cautious about this. You need to ob still observe all of the good things we've learned about building solutions over the years. The traditional good points. Of yes. The, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so who has responsibility for that then? Or, or how do you think that comes about? 
Is that through, through I, 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 I think it's all of us who are building solutions. I, I, I think we all, and, and I think our customers, our clients, have to hold us to that. I think it's very important that we, that we uh, have the procedures in place to do this correctly, but also be able to prove that we've got them. Because if, if you want an advantage for your company in this early stage of blockchain, tell people that you, know, you, you follow secured code development procedures, that you're, you know, that you're testing appropriately, that, that, you know, that, that you understand the security of all the data. Those kinds of things tend to get left behind a little bit as people are rushing to solution. I want to get my MVP out there in a hurry. We can skip yeah. that for now. I, I wouldn't. I, I really wouldn't. And, and I think that's on all of us as developers. I think uh, I would add on to that. Um, sometimes big organizations are blamed for the fact that they don't move very quickly. Mm -hmm. I think going back to that point that we have a lot of data, we are dealing with customers who we serve every day. And at any, I mean, in any case, we cannot put that data or the customers at, at loss in any yeah. way. So we have to be very careful that whatever solution we are, de we are developing, we have to move quick enough, correct. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we have the right controls and uh, risk mitigation processes in place which help us prevent, uh, do, uh, uh, help us prevent anything that uh, could potentially lead to a damage in, in that so, yeah, uh, it, Both very interesting observations because I've seen some, certainly over the last three or four years, I've seen some, what looked like on the surface, a very powerful fintech startup projects running and you start to scratch away at them and you realize they're, they're, they're built in too much of a rather lackluster prototyping methodology, mm -hmm. not even an agile methodology, but a prototyping methodology where they haven't applied that degree of diligence in their sprint to the market, but they end up with something where the first time they actually try to operationalize that, that starts to fall apart very, very quickly. So it sounds like very good advice to actually take those tenets of good software development forward into the blockchain, certainly if it is a gold rush, to use it to make sure you don't make mistakes when you're panning for gold. Brian, I know you've got a point there as well. I, th I think, come back to your point, I think we, 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 we've got a responsibility to take this at the speed that's needed from the, the, the individuals that are designing and building it. And as you know, with Corda, that's one of the main reasons why we haven't open sourced it uh, to, until the end of November. It's, uh, it's been in a sort of building side mode with select with the members and then we're going to go out. So that, that's great to have that, making sure that we get the get it to the open source level as you the uh, the, the gentleman earlier on made the point, once it's out there, we can further make sure we industrialise this code to a level where we don't have the, the issues. But the design itself has to be fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the issue we had earlier on with the, 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 the what happened with the, the uh, loss of revenue. Yeah. We, yeah. we have a design that doesn't fit what we're trying to use it for. So Corda, we've taken our time to make sure it's fit for purpose, but the responsibility goes beyond us as designers and as, as users. It's also to make sure that we have a, we don't just rush into a new model for consensus or we don't have a, 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 the, the, a notary approach or a, a proof of work when it's not appropriate. So yeah. that, that stepped approach needs to be beyond design of the code. Yeah. And lastly, some of the, the organisations everyone's writing out the equation right now is the sort of middlemen. Yeah. Some of them will be very, very well positioned to still act in a different form because they've got the, the legal regulation, the, the legal yeah. framework in place, they've got the data, but they've also got the trust. They've been providing a service to the members for 20 years, so mm. I think it's a bit quick to start putting them out the jigsaw. I, I, I take the point. I think, um, again, without... I'm not going to try and beat up on Deloitte here because I think all of the big four did this. But if you go back to probably 96 through 98, when suddenly uh, trusted certification authorities became the go-to thing for the big four to look at for the future. And there was this danger that the investment that was put in there was too quickly written off because the actual promise was a very sound and effective promise. To what extent do you think there's a risk that we might see some of that as we start to evolve blockchain further forward? There's a large risk. I mean, if we start building lots of different... Uh, th th if, you have, if you have an identity uh, reference uh, collaboration utility and then you have another one, we're not, we're not that much further forward. So mm. we've got to move forward, learn the lessons, and as you say, don't, like, like, don't be so quick to make sure that we're actually ruling things out when it might be that... The, the, the fundamentals and the principle and the participants 
we're going down a journey that works. And for me, it comes back to having this collaboration, collaboration. ownership, mm -hmm. yeah. having the regulators happy that we're going at a pace and then we're in a position whereby we don't have a monopoly, we don't have a technology lock-in, yeah. and we've got something that doesn't risk the customer's money, which is what we're meant to be looking after. Very good, thank you. I w one last question, which I noted down here earlier. Sorry, it was um, Rob's question. Yeah. Um, part of the question for Carl is, Stream of consciousness. Um, <laughs> Brian, what you said earlier about 70 organisations in the table at the moment, um, I presume they are all banking organisations. And I'm just thinking about the conversation I had with Mrs. Not using, me not using contactless, and certainly she articulated the benefits uh, of using contact, contactless. I'm thinking here is the stimulus towards adoption likely to come from outside financial services industry? Is it likely to come from, I mean, I'm thinking specifically here of retail banking because that's the area that's impacted me most recently when I'm using my card to pay for something. But is there a danger here that if it's only the financial services industry that's around the table, then adoption may be blocked because other stakeholders in the wider universe aren't quite realising the benefits at this point in time? Absolutely. We're not taking that approach for that very reason. Firstly, our 70 members are not just banks at this stage, but we want to continue to to evolve, but the, the individuals who are working on it and the organisations that we're plugging into the ecosystem are way beyond the, what would be traditional uh, financial markets. And I'm really, I'm really excited that I felt when I first started getting involved in this, it was almost like a us and them, you know, you'd mm -hmm. have like guys who are like uh, trying to disrupt the bank and then you'd have bank and then I think it's suddenly got to the point where everyone's just trying to improve it. Can we work together? And a lot of the people that are coming in are from completely different backgrounds and that's exciting. And, and to be perfectly fair to R3, financial services has certainly been the canary in this coal mine. I mean, it's gone way out ahead of everyone else. I think there's a bit of other industries watching financial services and wondering what's going to happen because this is a fairly radical departure from the way things have been done before. Uh, even though, as we've all said all along today, this is built from things that we already had. It's the way they've been put together that is really quite unique and, and quite new. So. You know, a lot of people are watching to see what happens, and, and I think a lot of people are, are curious, are very interested, are hoping that it can help. I think we see a lot of opportunity uh, in other industries, and in lots of other industries, and, and, and in certain types of, of use cases, but I think there will be a certain amount of, let's, let's wait and see, you know, the fast follower model, uh, mm -hmm. maybe not so fast, and, and let's, let's, let's see what happens, because there have been some very well-publicized hiccups along the way here. Uh, and that, you know, that, that doesn't help any of us, but it's, it's, it's actually a, a healthy part of this process. Let's remember, you know, that in, in the typical hype cycle, you know, we're still going uphill. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, financial services is, um, ironically, probably the most exciting area we have in technology because well, I, I've, I've been sort of stuck in it for the last 20 years, but the, it's, it's the one part of the industry, uh, that, of the technology sector that has money behind it to get on and do things. But you're right. I mean, I think we'll, as I keep saying, I think that from the financial services point of view, the, the things we'll start seeing happening first are the back office applications, the settlement, the clearance, all those things where we can save time, money. As long as we can stay 10 seconds ahead of the competition, that's good enough for most people. But, the, but uh, Kent alluded to it in the block to push. You know, we'll see, that in terms of the public adoption, we'll see... <clears throat> You know, ticketing. We'll, get, we'll rid, go, get rid of ticket touts if you can attest the, you know, the, the ownership of a ticket, and then you can transfer it directly without having to go through a middleman. So you know, the public will get involved in that. We've seen music rights with uh, Imogen Heap uh, at Devcon One last year yeah. talking through what she was going to be developing out on uh, with the help of um, Vina Gupta. And you know, we've even got you know got things like Solar Coin and, and uh, the Brooklyn project, where you're actually mm -hmm. having people who have got excess energy generated from their solar panels able to trade it now, effectively via the, the decentralised uh, ledgers that we have. So all, all these things will creep in. They won't have as much money behind them, and they might not have as much uh, global impact <coughs> in terms of. Well, it, the financial services stuff hopefully won't have a global impact. You won't see it. We'll just all have a little bit more money in our accounts or a little bit more interest to play with. But the the, the public applications are the things that will make it happen. Conversely, uh, even within the financial market space, there are areas which are completely virgin uh, and not being touched by blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the liability part of asset management. Mm -hmm. I've not seen anyone looking at this so far. And so, I mean, you know, it's, 
even though it's in the financial services area, uh, it's not going at the same pace everywhere. And just to add on to that, I think uh, that's a very fair point because even in, as, as a bank, we sort of keep in mind and make sure that, as Tom mentioned, if we can use a database for a particular uh, use case or solution, you should use a database and you should not rush into using blockchain for solving a particular problem. So as a bank, we try and make sure that for every use case, we work very hard that if, if blockchain is necessary there, then we use it. If it's not, then we don't use it. So I think uh, it's about the reach. It's about the potential impact it will have on the lives of our customers. And then it's, it's also about how much can we benefit uh, from the fact that we're able to serve our customers in a better way. Well, thank you all very much for that. Thank you um, to, to the audience for the questions and the panel uh, for those very informed answers. I think very useful, actually, very um, thought-provoking. I'm going to come and have a chat with all of you later uh, with my notepad. Um, what I want to do is just sum up very, very briefly, because I'm, I am conscious that time is pushing on. I want to make my uh, thanks first. I want to thank everybody who spoke today. Great presentations, insightful material, and hopefully you'll agree it was delivered in a way where it was entertaining and educating at the same time. So please just join me in showing my appreciation.